Okay. Ah, here I am in sunny Florida. Um, well, maybe not. At any rate, good, mo good morning, afternoon, evening, whenever you see this. Um, we have completed our series of messages on faces around the cross. There are other ones, but um, we've come a good way from Easter already, a couple months. That's hard to believe, isn't it? Uh, so I thought I would do some different things for the next couple of weeks. Um, today we're going to take a look at actually just a few verses. Um, Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Uh, and the message is entitled, How Salty Are You? So let's read. Matthew 5, starting with verse 13. The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is speaking, and uh, he says this. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything, except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So we we see Jesus is telling us here that we are salt and light. Um, we only have time today to look at salt, but uh, some very good things need to be said that uh, will encourage us in uh, being a witness for Jesus in this crazy world we live in in trying times so let's let's pray um, wonderful and gracious heavenly father in jesus name we come to you in the power of the holy spirit and uh, thank you for your word part a little tiny part of your sermon on the mount and uh, we pray that you'll you'll speak to our hearts this morning about being your witnesses uh, and all that we say and do. And we'll give you the thanks and praise for that. In Jesus' name, amen. A couple of decades ago, there was quite a controversy in our country called Watergate. Richard Nixon wound up resigning, and it was quite a mess. One of the men that served him and did some shady things behind the scenes was a fellow named Chuck Colson. He was called the Hatchet Man. And uh, he got himself in, in trouble and wound up getting convicted and going to jail for 10 months. Just before he went to jail, he became a true on fire Christian. And uh, he learned a lot in his 10 months in jail. And he saw the way things were in prison, and he thought, it's just not right. It's not rehabilitating anybody. It's not doing anything but just punishing people. And of course, you do wrong, you have to pay for it. But uh, wouldn't it be great if there was some way of trying to rehabilitate someone so that they don't continue to get in trouble? I had a prison ministry uh, many years ago in, in um, one of my congregations in Pennsylvania. Uh, a very powerful, eye-opening uh, kind of a ministry. And I, I always worked on trying to help people find the Lord and grow in the Lord. And if that is the case, and they really do become a follower of Jesus, a strong follower in Jesus, then the chances of them repeating, because a lot of people in jail are repeat offenders. Um, you can stop 
this pattern, break this pattern up and give them a new pattern, helping them to walk with Jesus and have a new life. So that's what I tried to do. Well, really, um, Chuck Colson and his ministry that he started, Prison Fellowship, was trying to do that and was very successful in, in many ways. Um, it became a worldwide ministry and has made a difference in many people's lives. At any rate, Chuck Colson, he's, he is deceased. He is now with the Lord. But his uh, organization still exists and is doing some great work. And I'd like to share a, a story in the earlier days of uh, his ministry, very uplifting and very encouraging story about uh, being a witness for Jesus. 1985 in North Carolina, uh, Governor James Martin asked Aaron Johnson to be his Secretary of Corrections. This is a very powerful position. Uh, you become uh, the most uh, important person or powerful person um, calling the shots in the prison system in the state of North Carolina. The governor said that he wanted the Secretary of Correction to be different from the others that have served in that position over the years. Uh, so when he chose Aaron Johnson, he sure picked somebody different and very effective. He was the first um, African American appointed to this position in North Carolina. He is the, at the time, he was the only uh, ordained minister or pastor in the country holding such a position. And um, his first official uh, position was to open the doors of all the state prisons of the state of North Carolina and challenge them to do business differently. He also opened the doors to prison uh, fellowship, Colson's uh, Christian ministry. Uh, and they started doing things that had never been done before in an effort to try to help people not be repeat offenders. So looking at an excellent example of what it means to be a, a Christian uh, and to be salt at the same time, here we have it. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. What in the world did he mean by that? Well, in the ancient world, salt was a treasure. It was a commodity of uh, great worth. It was the only preservative available at that time um, for food. There were no ice boxes, no freezers in those days. Salt in Jesus' time used to be rubbed into meat to preserve it. Uh, Colson writes, it was invisible, it mixed in, salt permeated the meat, preserving it from decay. And we as Christians are to be salt to our culture, preserving righteousness in our society. And Lord knows we need it now. Sometimes we are not visible or, or obvious, but we can make a difference. Because, excuse me, we become involved in everyday areas of life um, and so many different directions we can go um, and positively affect our culture for the gospel. Our presence and our influence can be felt in a, in a very positive way. So one thing salt does, um, in addition, addition to preserving, as in the culture in this case, uh, it makes people thirsty. And Colson goes on to say, so as we salt the various arenas of our world, we drive people to look for water. And what is that? What is the water that we want them to, to seek? We want them to seek the living water. And that's, of course, what Jesus offers, the living water. That's what Aaron Johnson did. 
first day of work, Aaron Johnson walked into this large office with a huge desk and the official insignia on the wall, all the trappings of great power. And what did he do? Strut in? No, no. He very humbly dropped to his knees. And he said, Lord, here I am. Use me however you want to. He got up, he called in his, his uh, chief legal advisor, and he said, tell me, how much power does the Secretary of Corrections have? The aide said, well, as much as you want within the you know, prison system. Now, and Johnson said, well, I mean from a statutory standpoint, how much authority do I have? Mr. Secretary, you can do whatever you want in these prisons. Well, then I want to stop the cursing in them. The profanity in these places is horrible. Are you serious, Mr. Secretary? The aide stammered. I'm dead serious. I want the very first order I send out to be an anti-cursing ordinance. You find a way to do it. Aide left shaking his head. But he returned a few hours later, dust covering the sleeves of his coat, antique law books in, in hand. And he said, uh, I, I found it, Mr. Secretary. There's an old statue against cursing in public and we can use it to issue your order. Thus profound language was prohibited in North Carolina prisons. At that point in time, I don't know what, what's happened since, but that was a good step. Soon after, Andrew Johnson got another idea. He discovered that soft core pornography magazines were being brought into the prison at state expense for the inmates. So he called in his legal counsel. How much authority do I have, he said. The advisor was ready for anything at this point. He said, well, what do you want to do now? And Mr. Johnson said, I want to stop Playboy magazines from coming into our prisons. Can I do that? You're the secretary, the aide said, you can do whatever you want. And so by official order, Playboy magazines are prohibited in North Carolina prisons. Again, I don't know if that's the case today, I wonder, but at least at that point in time, in, in the late 1980s, it was prohibited. Now we all realize that prisoners and guards still let some foul words fly and so have some lascivious thoughts and uh, that may mend enter into their lives, but much of it, at least at that point in time, was curtailed. At least that which inflames a person was eliminated. These steps, plus the Ministry of Prison Fellowship, began helping prisoners and guards alike to find Jesus Christ and start thinking on a higher plane. They were learning the word of God and thoughts of righteousness and spirituality in Christ. Now you're thinking, oh, that's a great illustration of a Christian who was salt in our society, but, but I'm no Aaron Johnson. Um, True, God has placed me in a, a position, I placed him in a position of authority. Over 15,000 employees and 20,000 prisoners, and they, they have to obey you. But each of us who love the Lord, we're not in the, such a position, but we can still affect a person here and a person there, a group here, a group there. We love the Lord, and we can be his salt wherever we are, whatever position we're in. 
what we need to do is this, fall on our, our knees in our workplace, our kitchen, our school, our neighborhood, and pray, Lord, here I am. Use me however you want to. I'd like to share with you one other truth about salt and how it relates to being the salt of the earth. Salt is made up, I'm sure many of you know, it's made up of two elements, sodium and chloride. Salt is sodium chloride. These two elements together make up common table salt. Sodium is very willing to combine with other elements. So some interesting things can be done with that. Chlorine is that poisonous gas that gives bleach its offensive odor. So what is all, how do we apply that to what we're talking about this morning? Well, we noted before that sodium chloride or salt was used in Jesus's day, <clears throat> excuse me, before days of refrigeration in order to preserve meats and bring out flavor in meats. I'd like to use two things that uh, are very important, just as salt, sodium chloride is important to, to preserving meat, giving it flavor. And think about how love and truth, spiritual uh, realities that Jesus has built into our world, how these two things combined are very, very necessary, and you need both of them. You need sodium and chloride to make salt, and you need love and truth to make a difference in this world as a witness for Christ. Love and truth can be like our sodium chloride. Love, first of all, without truth is flighty, unstable, sometimes blind, willing to combine with various doctrines which are not helpful. There are people that are very sweet and kind and loving and they want to do the loving thing and that is commendable. But if you got the wrong doctrine, you don't have the truth. And sometimes the way you apply love is more harmful than good. On the other hand, truth by itself can be very offensive sometimes even poisonous. Spoken without love, truth can turn people away, especially from the gospel. And no wonder some people hate God, hate the Bible, hate the church. We speak the truth, sometimes without love. And that doesn't come off very well. So it's very important that we don't beat people over the head um, with our Bibles as like a bricks on somebody's head, but we lovingly apply the Bible and its teaching. When truth and love are combined in an individual Christian's life or in the church, then we have what Jesus calls the salt of the earth. Both are needed. And we are able to preserve and bring out the beauty of our faith. So we need to be loving, but we need to tell the truth. Know what the truth is. That's why it's important to study the word and to be filled with the spirit of love. Amen? Many years ago, Dr. Coleman, who was my evangelism professor at Asbury Theological Seminary in Wilmore, Kentucky, said something I'll never forget. He said, be winsome, but be bold. And we need to keep those two in balance. Be winsome, kind and gracious and loving and thoughtful, but be bold. Don't be afraid to tell the truth in love. And that is what makes a person a witness for Christ. So I'd like to tell you a little story, a Kenilworth story. When I was a man in my mid-20s, 
I went to Dr. Samuel Klugman's office, which is only one block away from the, from the Methodist Church in Kenilworth, right on the boulevard. He had been the, 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 my dentist my whole life. And um, I had been in Kentucky studying uh, theological seminary, Asbury, and uh, had, was home for, the, for a time. So I came into the office for my appointment, moved, moved to the uh, window, to the receptionist. She pulled the, the window open and said, oh, hi, Don, how you doing? Good, good to see you. I'm glad that you're home. Uh, how's Kentucky? I said, oh, I love Kentucky. It's a beautiful state. And what a worthwhile thing I'm involved with down there. She said, yeah, I know. She said, Dr. Klugman, uh, have a seat. Dr. Klugman will be with you shortly. Said, Thank you. Now, there were four other adults in the room there, in the waiting room. And I prayed before I went in there, a very strong prayer. I want to witness, Lord. I'm willing. You open the door for me, and I will witness for you. I sat in the chair, and there was a woman sitting next to me with a magazine. She puts the magazine, lowers it, and she looks at me and she said, Kentucky, what's so important in Kentucky? I got her, in, her interest. I said, oh, I'm, I'm in a school here, and I'm studying one of the greatest things you could ever want to study. See, now a good way to witness is to get people asking you questions. Just give them a little information and kind of lead them along. So now I piqued her curiosity, and she says to me, what are you studying? And I said, I'm studying about the fact that God exists. And at a point in time, he himself came into this world. We call him Jesus of Nazareth. And he loved us so much that he laid his life down on a cross uh, in order to pay for our sins. And um, he wants us to, be, to know him and to be part of his kingdom. She was like, whoa, she was listening. Do you know what? There were three other adults in that room, all with magazines. They, they were doing this. They put the magazine down and <laughs> they were listening to every word I said. I had a captive audience and it was only like a two minute witness. Um, everybody had, I could tell it was get, getting in here and in here, they were listening. And just when I had completed what I had to say, a little window opened up, secretary or receptionist said, Don, come on in. <laughs> and so those people heard that gospel that day. So here's a question. How salty are you? Are you willing to be a witness for Jesus? How, then, can we become more salty? Well, like our our Lord, and like his child and witness, Aaron Johnson, make sure you surrender your life, all that you have, all that you are to the living God. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill you with love and compassion for people especially, and be hungry for the truth you find in God's Word. Because remember, we need love and truth. Look for opportunities. Pray ahead of time. God will prepare your heart and the person you're going to talk to. Look for opportunities to love people with the truth and trust the Lord to open doors. Okay, one more story. Now, this is another Kenilworth story, but it's a Kenilworth United Methodist Church story. There was a woman that I knew in the church hardly ever came. She was a member. Her name was Ann Crowder. Ann had three kids. I started a youth group here, two youth groups. I had a senior high and a junior high. And I had about 25, at least 25 kids, very active. We were doing things in the community all the time and just having a ball for the summer. And um, we would go on trips down the shore and trips to see the former youth pastor who had gotten a church in New Jersey. And we were doing all kinds of things. So in order to, to have like 20 kids go on a trip, I needed help. So I got the parents going. So now we pull the parents in. And we had four or five carloads of kids <laughs> traveling all, all over the place. And we were just having a ball. It was a fantastic experience for all those kids and myself and the parents. 
Um, as we were going along, we decided that we were going to um, bring the whatever senior high kids could go to North Carolina, <laughs> the North Carolina again, to um, the Mecca uh, of Methodism in the southeastern part of, of the country, to Lake June Luska. A lot of our bishops have retired there. It's a beautiful, beautiful lake in, in the Smoky Mountains, 700 mile trip. So all summer long, we're raising money, bake sales and uh, newspapers and all kinds of things. Um, and seven or eight of the kids were going to go. Um, Anne's had three kids, Anne Prouder. Uh, one was in the junior group, but she had two girls going into their junior and senior years in high school. And um, the oldest was Jill, and she was an atheist, she said, but she was very peaked and interested by um, what we were talking about, because I was always sharing the gospel. So we did, went on a walk-a-thon that I developed. It was 20 miles, covered many, many towns in Union County. And we raised a lot of money doing that. But the sad thing is, Jill was only a third of a mile from the church. She had gone over 19 miles. She was very tired. She's trying to cut cut a street off. She was climbing over a fence. It was a cyclone fence that had barbs on the top. She slipped and cut her legs to pieces. She wound up in the hospital with tetanus shot and I don't know how many stitches. In 10 days, we were going to North Carolina and the doctor said, forget it. And she was heartbroken. But we said, look, we're going to pray and see what Jesus does. Well, about eight, nine days later, a couple of days before the trip, the doctor said, I can't believe this. You have healed so fast. I'm going to let you go. And she was so delighted. And those kids and myself and the parents that went, we were touched deeply by all the ministry that went on down there in North Carolina for that whole week. It was a fantastic experience. And Jill you know, went on to, to be a Christian. So that was a great thing. One day, a couple weeks later, I was gonna, I was asked by my by the senior pastor to give the message. I didn't even know what I preached on, I can't remember. I'd have to look it up. But a couple of days before that, Anne was talking to me about what had happened. And she said, What is it with you anyway? I've never seen anybody quite a young man act like you do. So oh, is that? she says, no, no, it's absolutely wonderful. You really love these kids. I said, yeah, I do. And she says, well, what is it about you? I said, it's not that I'm a great person. I just serve a great God. And any loving good thing that I do is because Jesus has <laughs> had quite an effect upon me and, and guides me to do the things that I say and do. She says, well, I don't know what it is you have, but I want it. So a couple of days later, it's Sunday morning, I preached the gospel, and I gave an altar call. And I will never forget it. She got up out of her seat, and she ran down that altar, or ran down that aisle to the altar. And when she did, I don't know how many other people also came to the altar to give their hearts to Jesus that day. It was a tremendous, tremendous experience for all of us. The Holy Spirit moved mightily that day. And it's all because we serve a great God. And if we're just willing to serve him and be his salt, there's no telling what can be done. So one of the most practical ways to be salt is to be a friend to a lot of people. And as they get to know you and they discover that you speak truth and in love and that you're a disciple of Jesus, eh, some of them are really going to get open and wonder, wow. And one day they may ask for counsel or your understanding of something. They, they are going to be pulled towards Jesus. Um, so be salt for the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you and praise you that you call us to be salt. Help us to, in our hearts and minds, be willing to do that, to be fitted with truth and love, 
And we'll give you the thanks and praise for making us salty in Jesus' name. Amen.